Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Raggio. I'm a senior fellow at Foundation for Defense of Democracies and editor of FDD's Lone War Journal. This is Generation Jihad, the podcast that covers all things in what used to be known as the global war on terror, but we now call the long war. Today, uh, Joe Trusman, my friend and colleague and a research analyst at FDD's Lone War Journal, is going to join me. We're going to talk two topics today, of course, related to Israel's war with Hamas and company. Um, we're going to talk about the news that's broken over the last, I guess, 24 hours with a ceasefire, which some people seem to want to refer to as a pause in fighting and the implications of that. What, are the, what is the, the nature of the deal? And then we'll talk a little bit about the um, increased number of militia attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria and U.S. responses. There's been a couple of interesting developments on that front that Joe and I will explore uh, briefly. So, uh, Joe, welcome back to Generation Jihad. Great to have you again. Great pleasure to be here, as always, Bill. Yeah, yeah looking forward to our conversation, as always. Let's start with that ceasefire, Joe. Um, first, um, if you can lay out the details, what um, what is the actual plan here? When is it implemented? And uh, yeah, what are the details? Right. So. Um, so, yeah, so there is a ceasefire in place uh, without it's going to be in place. Rather, an agreement has been made, essentially. So um, the Israelis have confirmed it. Hamas has confirmed it. Qatar has confirmed it. The, the Biden administration has confirmed it. So uh, so we know something's in place, right? So, so uh, this, this agreement is in place. So essentially what it is, is that uh, Israel and Hamas are going to exchange, um, uh, Hamas is going to release uh, 50 hostages. From what I understand, they are women and children that were abducted, that were kidnapped from uh, southern Israel on October 7th. And uh, in exchange... The the Israelis will uh, free uh, Palestinian women and uh, teenagers. I, I don't know the ages, but um, as far as the the, uh, the minors uh, that are in Israeli prisons. Uh, so, I thought the it's going to be from what the numbers are, I I've been looking at fifty Israeli hostages for, I believe, three hundred. Uh, Palestinian prisoners. Uh, so, and that's going to be over the course of uh, four days that this, uh, that these batches of hostages or, or prisoners are going to be released uh, between the two. So, uh, and then during that time as well, there'll be a ceasefire, so a cessation of military activity uh, on both sides. I believe there is some stipulations as well that there won't be during some time uh, within the that those four days during that time, there won't be like drone overflights by the military, by the Israeli military in certain areas of the Gaza Strip during certain hours. And uh, but even though it seems that it's going to blind the Israelis, I think they still have a good handle, especially in intelligence of what's happening in Gaza. So anyway, so that's the gist of it. All right, uh, but this is just preliminary right now uh as far as this um this this ceasefire this this hostage uh swap i think this is just one of this is just the small piece of something much larger that's going to happen as far as possible prisoner swap um between both sides so i, I and i don't know if there's going to be any more to be quite honest with you, the israelis may be able to find them find these hostages uh before any more deals can be made but anyway that's it that's really what's been happening. That's the main thing that's been happening um, over the, since we last talked. Of course, there's still fighting going on, uh, and in the north uh, with Hezbollah, and then uh, actually this morning there was a cruise missile that was intercepted by the Israelis uh, in south that was heading towards Elat in southern Israel. So, it may have been the Houthis, it may have been someone else. I don't know. They had they didn't say, but. Uh, that's the gist of it, at least in the last since since we last talked. So let's delve a little bit into that. Um, the first thing that catches my attention on the deal, the ratio. So you basically have a six Palestinians for one Israeli hostage. 
released. I mean, I, it just amazes me, Joe, that Israel is willing to play this game. How does it let Hamas get the upper hand them, on them when Hamas was the one that instigated this current conflict, that they're the one that attacked Israel? Um, why does Israel agree to this? Are they? I mean, to me, it's it's a mistake. Just that alone, because, and we'll get into it. I want to get your your opinion on this deal, but this this part really bothered me. Um, the overflights as well, which we'll get into next. It just it just screams of desperation by the Israelis, and to me, it's just more incentive for Hamas to drag out these. Um, negotiations for hostage release. It's this exact. The Israelis, I just am shocked that they haven't figured out the Palestinian, the Hamas playbook by now. After all of these decades of unbalanced prisoner exchanges, I mean, I guess it's better than a thousand for one, um, which has happened in the past. But I, you know, I, I you know, and, and you had made a great point, Joe, um, that, you know, this is the Hamas came out and tried to say these are women and children. But I can't confirm this list, but I saw, you know, I was looking at the ages. They were 16, said these are 17, 18. These were individuals who were detained within the last year. They're essentially military age males. Um, so Hamas is going to get a little infusion of fighters from this as well. What are your thoughts on that, Joe? Yeah, I know you make great points. Um, since I haven't really, I've seen lists, but um, I'm not sure how official they are. So yeah, exactly. I wasn't sure, so I didn't want to um, say for sure. But but regardless, yeah, you make, again, you make these good points. I mean, we know Hamas trains kids. They train teenagers. They, they train uh, 16, 17-year-olds and uh but you know they give military training in the gaza strip but uh but yeah and we got to understand too this is something crucial i think uh these the the the, the hostages or the, the prisoners and the hostages here the prisoners are convicted uh criminals or the, because they've they've either uh attempted a terrorist attack all right and failed uh, or they were in the act of doing something, uh, in the act of doing a terrorist attack, but whatever, something happened and, and, and they were caught. So, and then trying to compare these to hostages or the people, c- civilians that were essentially abducted from their homes in a terrorist attack, you know, you can't equate the two together, right? So essentially what this is, is just when it comes down to it, it's, civilians being traded for terrorists this is the way i see it i think this is what's going to going to be here even though i haven't seen the list i have a pretty good feeling and uh this is what's 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 happening here uh and but there's precedence unfortunately you know again going back to gilad shalit and the prisoner swap and you know one soldier for over a thousand palestinian prisoners and then look what happened. You got uh, Hamas got uh, Yahya Sinwar out of it, and in, I mean, in hindsight, of course, the Israelis wouldn't would not have ever let him out, considering what he's done since he, you know, he, he since he was released in that in that swap. And uh, so, anyway, yeah, it's bad because it just it just shows that Israel in 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 you can look at it as Israel. Um, willing to give a lot you know uh for its civilians which i complete i I do understand you know i completely understand that uh but at the same time terrorist groups take advantage of that and not only hamas i mean hezbollah has done the same thing too right so um we're not (laughs) this isn't just like a palestinian thing so um so israel's foes or the terrorist organizations that are fighting israel they know if they can abduct uh, an Israeli, whether it's a civilian or a hostage, they can get a lot out of it. So, I don't know. Israel is kind of stuck here, right? Because they're under the the the. You don't understand too that the Israeli government is under immense internal pressure here from civilian population from um, to to get those hostages released, right? Uh, I mean, you can only imagine. Uh, you know, having your 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 mother or your child. Uh, taken hostage so um i understand that too but problem is some of these 
I'm, I'm really concerned, especially with if there's another one, there's another swap, that there's going to be Palestinian prisoners with blood on their hands, convicted terrorists, right, uh, that are going to be released because there's some big ones out there that I'm sure Hamas wants um, out of Israeli prisons uh, that are that could potentially be released and cause further harm to to Israel down the road, which has already happened. Like with, the, with there's prisoners that were released in Gilad Shalit that just re- returned returned back to their activities, right? So uh, against Israel, so. That's that's another concern. So it's tough. It, it's a really tough situation, Bill. Um, you know, on one hand, I want to be human and 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 say, you know, yeah, of course, you know, you want these families to be reunited, but at the same time, look what's the potential damage that it can cause down the road. So it, it's a tough situation. Yeah, and I, listen, I you know that is the you know I I certainly get my view on this comes off as heartless towards the hostages towards the fa- the families but I, I just keep going back to this is what got israel in this situation to begin with right cutting right. deals like this you know I'm, I'm you know coming back to failed policies and you know why isn't this ratio the other way why isn't it 50 israeli prisoners to 12 hamas members right why isn't israel s- insisting you know, I, and you know, there's another thing too, and I don't know if any polling has been done on this. You said there's pressure internally within Israel, but I would be curious to see. And I have no doubt that the family members who's who of those who are held hostage are pressuring the government. But what about the family members of those who've been killed or wounded? Um, you know, are they really happy about this, or just the average Israeli? Um, about a deal again. I don't. I I laud the Israeli government for working to to get their people out. Um, but the terms of this deal, you know, and then we go. We'll we'll talk about the overflight here, right? What exactly do the Israelis thinks is going to happen? I believe it's about a four or six hour period of no overflights by Israeli aircraft over the Gaza Strip. I mean, that should be that would be a non-starter if I was the Israelis. It's just. Sure. Why don't you guys just go ahead and operate out in the open and we won't be able to observe you? Um, that's just madness to me. This in, this entire deal. And I do have one more one question to you. I'll get your opinion on that and your overall opinion on the deal. But do we know if any foreign hostages are members of this deal? Are there any Americans that are um, in consideration for being released? Right. I saw reports and I can't confirm right now, but I did see initial reports that a few, maybe three are Americans, but there's other nationalities that, you know, uh, uh, people from, from other nations that have been uh, held hostage. So they're held, being held hostage. So I don't think they, they're, they're being released. I mean, it, of course they could be released in, in, a another swap, but, um, that, that's what I know right now. So, uh, so yeah, it's again, just, yeah, going back to what you're saying, um, uh, don't mean to sound heartless, but yeah, it's, um, it's a bad precedence that that was set back in uh, 2011. So with Gilad Shalit, uh, I don't I, I don't know either why. I, I think I think it's maybe has to do with there's more pressure on the Israelis to get a hostage deal done than there is pressure on Hamas to yeah to release the hostages. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right, Joe. I Where is the why. international pressure on Hamas to release these right. hostages? Exactly, it's the international community is silent on this issue essentially. And in my opinion, the Biden administration is playing into Hamas's hand by not, you know, the American hostages should be in a separate issue from the Israeli hostages. And this is the huge mistake the Biden administration is making. The Biden administration should be sitting there saying, I want my I want my Americans back now. This has, you know, unconditional. No, this is non-negotiable. And yet he's putting them in the Israeli bucket. And thus, you know, feeding this problem, making America part of the, uh, you know, th- it's playing exactly into Hamas's hand. I can't believe, if, you know, either people don't understand, in the administration don't understand this or do and don't care. Um, but no matter what, what the reasoning is for this, it's enabling Hamas. It's allowing them to stretch it out. And there was one more thing I heard. I heard the Israelis made a statement saying that they were willing to extend 
this the this d if if hamas would um consider releasing more prisoners so again playing if that's true that's playing into hamas's hand because hamas could dangle a prisoner to out and get a day and get a day and allow them to regroup and allow them to move people around and what do you what do we think they're doing with those hours of no overflight I just this is an absolute disaster. This is the beginning, uh, in my opinion, if the Israelis continue go, to go down this road. Um, I'm just seeing more of the same, uh, more of what led us to October 7th. But I'll get off my soapbox now and um, <laughs> ask you, what, what do you think of this deal in general? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, again, it's, you, know, you make good points. Um, you know, I think uh, the unfortunate part, at least for the Israelis, um, that I don't think Hamas knows where all the, all, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but all the hostages are. And you got it was a free for all on October 7th. I hate putting it that way, but that's what it was. It was a free for all. So, I mean, there were Palestinian civilians going into the, the, the communities in southern Israel. All right. So it wasn't just armed members of the armed groups. So uh, I, I, I have a very strong feeling that there's maybe uh, criminals or gangs or whatever that. May have one or two hostages, right? That Hamas doesn't know where where they are, and then there's other groups as well. I mean, I know we know Islamic Jihad has group has them, and yes, they have a they do have a relationship with Hamas, and so they could probably work something out. But um, but still, I, I don't think Hamas knows where all the hostages are, and that's a big problem. So anyway, you know, I'm just conflicted to be honest with you. The again, like I was saying. The human side of me that you know wants to say yes, it's a good thing. Get the families reunited, but this will only lead to more attempts to get hostages, to abduct Israelis or um, abduct Americans. Uh, you know, to, to in exchange for more Palestinian prisoners. So, um, yeah, I'm just glad I'm not in the Israeli government shoes right now, to be quite honest with you. But it's a, it's all messed up. I think all of this is just uh, it's tough. So. Yeah. In fairness to the Israelis, it's easy for you and I to, you know, right. sit here <laughs> yeah. in the United States and opine yeah. about the mistakes. <laughs> True. But it is our job, right? And um, you know, we're uh, being we're certainly are trying to be dispassionate observers of and observers of this conflict over the years and you know, we see the mistakes being made. You know, it's just <laughs> you know, I get back to you're negotiating with a terrorist group and look, and, and as far as Okay, fine. How about Hamas turns over all the hostages? It knows where they are. And then it works to find out where the rest are. Um, and that's another reason, right? So there's going to be a ceasefire here, Joe, right? But what if these other groups aren't on board with it? What if kids or what if the Islamic Jihad or popular resistance committees or the other groups don't want to do this? What if they're unwilling to release those hostages? Right. And, then what? Uh, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's uh, something I brought up uh, some weeks ago. And I mean, if Hamas really wants to find them, uh, they can uh, if they really want. But I don't think they're willing to risk uh, causing problems with other organizations, especially Islamic Jihad. All right. But as since Hamas is the ruler of the Gaza Strip, is the whatever you want to call them, the governing body of the Gaza Strip, um, they're ultimately responsible. All right. So if they want to, they can. Yes, I understand it's a war zone. I understand it would probably take them more time than if, if there wasn't conflict. But if they really tried, I think they they could find uh, most of the hostages at least, or at least all of them. So, uh, so yeah, I'm not sure if they're willing to do that right now. Uh, so now it's up to the IDF really uh, to find them. I don't know if it's, if if that's going to be even possible. Yeah, at the end of the day, I just think this sends all of the wrong messages. It it just reeks of past failures, of past failed policies, and um, it really gives Hamas the ability to drag this out. Because I think at the ultimately. Right. The Hamas is going to sit there and say, look, we were willing to extend this ceasefire. Because look, we know the, the, the fighting is going to resume at some point. Hamas is going to take the opportunity and say, look, the Israelis are warmongers. They're occupiers. They're, you know, Zion, they're XYZ, right? All the names they're going to call them. We were willing to negotiate peace here and we were operating in good faith. If it wasn't for the Israelis and now they're killing, you know, it, we're just going to hear this. It's, it, 
the serious again in my opinion serious missteps by the israeli government um but we're gonna find out right um and i you know i guess at the positive on the positive side 50 prisoners or 50 hostages are going to get reunited with their families but um i just think the israelis need to be looking at the big picture here and i i'm not seeing that right now with this deal uh i understand they're under a lot of pressure from the international community from the biden administration particularly but uh the israelis should be forging ahead um with its long-term national security goals um you know that should be the the primary focus of everything they do but you know and again um we you know the human side to, of me as you noted joe says well at least 50 prisoners will get released but um yeah that's that's i guess cold comfort um joe let's take a take a look at the militia attacks um i'll just you know briefly you know we've been following this issue since its inception the militias which um are uh basically iranian proxies in iraq and syria they've been set up by the iranians uh pre-us invasion but the bulk of these groups were set up post-us invasion after 2003 these dangerous groups uh killed well over 600 american troops as well as british and other allied troops and thousands of iraqis who dared had the temerity to stand up to um to the iranian efforts to influence the iraqi government um these these are dangerous groups iran uses them uh, again as proxies these have been set up as a um to operate as an analog to hezbollah um except the problem you have here in iraq particularly is you have a recruiting base that's oh i don't know nine times as great as the recruiting base in um in lebanon this is an issue that's been ignored for years it's really only come to the fore now that this war has kicked off these groups have been attacking since october 17th well over 60 attacks i don't have the exact number because u.s military isn't really talking about it at the moment um they're attacking u.s bases in both iraq and syria their goal is to try to drive out the u.s out of these bases uh iran does not like u.s forces anywhere near its borders um it's the same reason they supported the uh, Afghan Taliban and Al Qaeda against the United States up, up until the withdrawal. Um, so we have these attacks. The U.S. has responded. So the first three times the U.S. responded, it, the attacks took place in Syria, um, which we expect, right? Syria is kind of a playground for everyone right now. It's a lawless uh, country where conducting airstrikes. On, on this is for all sides right kind of there's no consequences to it um so that's where we would expect the u.s to launch strikes but over the last two days the u.s has conducted two strikes inside of iraq and um that, that is certainly a little bit eye-opening um because the u.s does not want to destabilize the iraqi government these militias are very influential they have political parties that wield significant power and the militias themselves are part of what's known as the Popular Mobilization Forces, which is a official military arm of the Iraqi um, government. And it reports directly to the prime minister. But in reality, it really reports to the supreme leader in Iran. Many of the militia commanders have sworn allegiance to, or said that they would overthrow the Iraqi government if the supreme leader of Iran would, would order them to do so. These groups are funded and trained and armed and and given intelligence and by uh, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and the Quds Force. Um, so anyway, we had these two attacks in in the last twenty four hours, and one of the interesting things uh, was one of the attacks hit a vehicle um, that was used an attack on U.S. base at Al, Al Assad Air Base, and then the second attack, which occurred in the uh, I believe in the last. Uh, 12 to 16 hours um uh targeted two facilities in an area known as jerfal soccer or um that is about 60 i actually was when i was embedded with u.s military i was there i i and, and watched the what was known as the sons of iraq uh, you know fight against al-qaeda there though these most of the sunnis have been driven from that area by the militias and that's that's a stronghold of the militias. So today, the U.S. launched airstrikes on two militia facilities. No reports of any deaths. 
but um yeah so this is a significant um and but okay so and i'll i'll end it here joe and i'll get your get your thoughts on this um in, in the statement second con statement about today's strike um they noted they described um the um the attacks were being launched by not just the quote iran back groups but they they explicitly mentioned Iran, and I think that's the first time I'd noted that they said Iran was directly responsible for these attacks. They've been hinting that Iran has been, you know, involved in supporting these militias or the Iranian back. So I thought that was interesting. And then um, they also noted that the Air, U.S. Air Base, that Ainul Assad Air Base in Anbar Province, also I've been there before, um, had um, was attacked with a, what they called a quote short range ballistic missile end quote. Joe, um, what's your takeaway from the recent activity in in Iraq against the Iranian backed militias? Right. So it's um, you know, it's certainly escalating, I think, uh slowly. It's not um, like significant, like we're not seeing hundreds of rockets or you know, attacking uh American positions all at the same time. So it, it's a gradual escalation, uh, like with this short range ballistic missile. Uh, Iraqi militias operating under the uh, Islamic resistance in Iraq, uh, which is just a front. Basically, we've we've talked about it before. Uh, these 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 militias these create they create proxies and the proxies create proxies and it's just it's pretty crazy and it, it can be tough to track sometimes to be quite honest with you. And sometimes I, I, we did this with Caleb Weiss, just you know our, our colleague at, at Long War Journal. Where we would uh, would write about a certain group claiming, we, which we knew was a front group, but they would claim a certain attack, right? And then uh, against uh, American forces, and then uh, then you would never hear about them again. You'd, they'd claim like one or two attacks, and then boom, they'd disappear. Never hear from them again. So pretty indicative that they were just uh, that the group was just uh, a front, right? And um, but anyways, so now yeah, so we're seeing these these threats. Uh, with this, especially with the short range ballistic missile a uh, couple i think it's been a couple of weeks now that the islamic resistance in iraq uh warned that they would use these type of missiles this type of weaponry against american troops in 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 uh in syria and iraq and uh they did so which is uh very interesting so they um so yeah so and i think that's what uh spurred the biden administration to uh especially in the last 12 hours to respond right to these attacks to these militias um i think uh and uh i don't mean to to correct you here bill uh but in the last attack if i heard you right um i think there were eight P, uh, pmf uh, popular mobilization forces members killed did they confirm that? I had just saw a, a mention of that in the press, but I didn't see any confirmation yeah, yeah. from the militias themselves. So, right, there were um, martyr pictures of. Them. There were so, okay, great. Yeah, so of eight of them, yeah, and I, and I saw some of the statement. I'm, 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 I'm ninety nine point nine percent sure. So, I, I think it did happen, uh, which is a lot. It's a lot. Um, I mean, compared to previous American responses, so uh, I think that's important to note. So. But you know the interesting thing is that it's it's taken this long for the United States to do something sig well say significant but something right actually like hurt these militias. But I don't know what it's going to uh, how things are going to come out of this. Right? Are they going to continue? Are the these militias going to continue attacking American positions after the strike? And actually, I will say just in the last few minutes. This uh, Islamic uh, resistance in Iraq just uh, published a statement saying that they attacked, uh, I think it's Al Harir Air Base, uh, or it's one of the air, uh, bases that hosts troops. Uh, that they that they just uh, that they launched an attack against the base. So uh, I didn't uh, read the details, uh, but so I don't know how deterred these these militias are even after uh, the strike earlier today. So. Um, and also something really important I do want to mention is this. So all of this started post October 7th, right? At least, uh, the, the big stuff that, that have been happening over the last week, uh, in, in, against, uh, American troops in Iraq and Syria and, um, uh, the militias have been blaming, uh, the Americans involvement in, uh, the Gaza conflict between, you know, Israel and Gaza and Hamas. 
but there's a ceasefire coming up. So does that mean that these militias are going to stop? Right. It's interesting. And, and not only just these, this front, right. These fronts with Iraq and Syria, but I'm curious, will it also stop within Lebanon? Will it all stop in with the, the Houthis during the ceasefire, these four days? I'm very curious. I think at least in regard to the Hezbollah and, and the Houthis, or at least Hezbollah, um, that it probably will. I think it, it may as well uh, with 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 the the, the Iranian militias. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's something to watch. It may stop actually. So, which is a good thing, right? Uh, for for the, for uh, for the American troops. So we'll see. Uh, but yeah, so that's currently my take right now. I don't. I still don't think the the Iranian militias, these Iran backed militias, are deterred at all. Um, so, uh, but. Hopefully, we'll see a cessation of hostilities during the ceasefire in in, in, in Israel and Gaza. We'll see. Yeah, it's a, that that really is an excellent point. Yeah, it's something I hadn't considered. What would be the response of the other members of the Access of Resistance? And I'll tell you what: if I was the um, Israelis, if the Houthis launched something at me during that ceasefire, I'd take the opportunity to violently respond to that to make, to set the marker. Um, I realize that that may some may think that might lead to an escalation in conflict. It might cause, you know, the, if the Israelis come and pound sites inside of Yemen, it might give the Houthis pause to, and, and might give Hezbollah pause to, to mess around while this ceasefire is underway. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will disagree with me on that, but uh, that's exactly what I do. I mean, I think you respond in these situations, particularly when there's been an attempt to de, and a good faith attempt to de escalate, um, to, to adhere to a ceasefire if these other groups are still weighing in. They should, um, the Israelis should make a statement, um, because they certainly would have the time and, uh, resources to make it. You had, um, made an, you know, an interesting point as well. You had noted that it's almost like the militias in Iraq and Syria, they're launching enough attacks to turn up the heat, but did not cause that pot overboil. And this is a lot like what Hezbollah is doing in Northern, uh, or in Southern Lebanon. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I don't know. I there's just so, you know, I'm just trying to wrap my head. All of this is so. It can be obviously complicated, right? Uh, and I just want to go back to what we were talking about just a moment ago. I'm sorry, um, but the statements you got to remember that the statements from the Houthis, statements from the Iraqi militias, Hezbollah, and other members of the Axis of Resistance have all linked the uh the war in gaza to their attacks on u.s troops right so um so yeah so i if so if there's no war if there's ceasefire then you think that hey let's stop but they're gonna they're gonna stop uh attacking as well so um so yeah it's it's very uh i i it's all just, just trying to figure this out what they're gonna do but I, back to what you're saying as well with the israelis it did cross my mind as well. Oh, this would be a perfect time for the Israelis to respond to like the Houthis, for example. And something else I just want to bring up as well. I, I keep adding stuff and forgive me, Bill. Um, the So this morning, the Houthis claimed responsibility for uh, sending, for attacking, uh, or I think they said they sent drones uh, to uh, attack uh, southern Israel, the, the, the city of Elat, which they have before. The Israelis said earlier today that they intercepted a cruise missile fired in uh, from the Red Sea in the Red Sea area uh, in the area of Elat. So it was probably the Houthis. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, that the Houthis, when they they just made the statement just a few minutes ago, um, that that uh, they did it in response to not only what's happening in Gaza, okay, but that what's happening in the West Bank, okay. And that's very important because the violent, I don't expect the violence in the West Bank to stop. Okay. The, the, the issue there, just for the listeners that don't understand, don't know is that the, over the last two and a half years, Palestinian armed groups and, uh, Israeli forces have been clashing, um, routinely, uh, in, in the West Bank and the Palestinian armed groups have been launching attacks against Israeli settlements, against Israeli civilians, uh, in the West Bank. And I don't expect that to stop at all by no means during this ceasefire, because I don't think that was a part of the agreement anyway. It wasn't even mentioned anything in the West Bank. So, so for, and I, I haven't seen that, that, that the mention of the West Bank by the Houthis before in their statements, 
about attacking Israel. So um, they may not stop. All right, they may continue firing rockets. And um, so yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting. I know I saw that, so I was like, hmm, I don't know if they'll stop. But anyway, I, I digress. Forgive me. Uh, I may have not even answered your original question, but I just wanted to add a little bit to to uh, what's been happening. No, it, Joe, it's an, it, they're excellent points, right? Like this is conflict is larger than just Gaza. And Israel is, you know, in good faith going to try to adhere to a ceasefire. It would behoove all of the rest of Israel's enemies to do so. But as you noted, right, the, the conflict in the West Bank, um, how does that apply to this? These are, you know, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have the answers to these questions, but we're going to find out over the next couple of days, um, you know, if these groups all do adhere to it, that tells us something, right? That there is very likely some significant command and control here. And where is that coming from? If these it show, will show a degree of organization by these groups. And if, if it isn't, well, it doesn't disprove command control, um, command and control, but it does show that, you know, these groups are still willing to turn up the heat uh, despite attempts at a ceasefire. So, well, Joe, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Generation Jihad and for your thoughtful um, insights and questions. It's uh, always great to have you. I oh, appreciate it. I love talking uh, about these subjects. You know, it's um, what I do, what I focus on. So it's always a pleasure to be here to talk about it. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for today's episode of Generation Jihad. Just a reminder, you can find us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a review, preferably a positive one, but only if we earned it. Thanks again, and we'll see you all again soon.